in general, when people are worrying, when we worry, we, there are two thinking errors. We, we tend to overestimate uh, the probability or risk of a bad event occurring. In fact, studies show that 85% of what we worry about never happens. And then the other thing is, is that we then underestimate our ability to cope, that most of the time, even if the bad thing occurs, we cope with it better than we, than we think we are. Where I find that I get the most bang for my buck is to actually look at the process of worry itself, right? And I will tell you that that um, that there that there are are um, that therapists who don't specialize in anxiety disorders often don't know about this kind of work to actually, rather than going for the content of the worry, it's the process that people go when they worry. Let me take you through an exercise, a really quick exercise, right? To sort of demonstrate this. All right. What I want you to do is, is I want you to just, just think of a worry that you have. And, and it does not even have to be about sarcoidosis. It can be about anything. All right. Okay. Now, when I say go, I want you to worry on purpose for 30 seconds. All right? Ready? Go. All right, come back. Are you back? The only people I can see are, are, are Sean and Abigail. Are you guys back? Okay. Now, I want you to notice something. Notice when I said come back, it's you knew exactly what I meant. Right? Right? You, you were off in worry land, and you would intuitively noticed how to come back. And how'd you come back? You came back to me to connect with me, right? In fact, you even made eye contact with me, right? It's like everybody intuitively knows how to do this. Well, isn't this interesting? right that that actually worry is something you can control and stop right? at least with you know in this demonstration so i want you to do it one more time and i want you to notice what you do and i have never done this exercise where people don't do this when i say go there's actually something that you physically do when you go into worry. Ready? Go. There it is. What'd you do? Every what you did is is that you broke eye contact and you either looked up, looked down, closed your eyes, or whatever. What and 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 what you do is what we do when we worry is that we break contact with the present moment connected to the present moment through our senses, what we can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. And we go up into our imagination and time travel. Actually, neuro neurophysiologists have actually identified the time traveling circuitry in the brain. And we time travel and we, and we go into this bubble of our imagination. All right. And, and it's, it, it's like we're gone. It's a different place. Now I want you to do this one more time, and I want you to, and I want you to, to try this. Stare at my nose. All right, now worry. It's a lot harder, isn't it? Right. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that my nose has magic anti-worry properties. What it does say, what it does say is, is that if we stay connected to the present moment, through our senses, to the task at hand, to what's going on, to what's actually happening, right? This gives us an anchor that helps us either stay out of our imagination or come back from our imagination when we notice that we're gone. And this is what we mean by addressing, addressing the process of worry rather than the content of worry. So <clears throat> worry has two components. Virtually all worry has two components. It begins with a question. 
it's almost invariably what if or maybe or could be what if some catastrophe or poor outcome right and so it's almost always future oriented it's usually based on some trigger in the here and now, often the case of health anxiety, it's a physical sensation. And let me say that a physical sensation is not the same thing as a symptom, right? Right? A, a physical sensation like, like a tightness in your chest or a pain in your head, that's a sensation. A symptom is when you add a story to it, and the story may or may not be accurate, right? So it almost always involves imagining and simulating some possible event, usually in the future. The other component of worry is the attempt to answer the what-if question. It's repetitive. It involves, it, it, what it does is, is when we, when we engage with the what-if question, it keeps us immersed in, in the imagined story. And then what happens is, is when we get immersed in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the story, like watching a scary movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 13, when you're absorbed in the story, your fear center will, re will, will be triggered as if it's actually occurring. So when do we try to answer the what if question? Right. Sometimes it's useful, but you must be able to answer the following two questions with with a yes, or 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 it must fit the following two criteria: that it's a solvable problem in the here and now, namely we have enough information to do something about it, right? To to figure out a problem, and there's something that we can do about it in the here and now. All right. If not, our job is to recognize the what if question and not answer it. <clears throat> what I've come to understand is, is that worry is best understood as a habit, right? And that it is a and it is and it is a habit that seems to be both useful and uncontrollable. And that we tend to engage in this habit in the presence of uncertainty. I'm not going to get too much in this, is that actually it's useful to sort of ask yourself when you notice that you are worrying a lot, time traveling, trying to figure out or predict or or make sure that this feared event doesn't occur, that there's actually part of us that at least that believes that there's something valuable about it right it can be a kind of rehearsal it can be keep me from getting blindsided that somehow i'll find an answer if i ruminate ruminate about this that actually if i don't worry about it somehow i'm being irresponsible or careless or that i don't care so how do we break the worry habit it's important to examine your beliefs about worry as being either something you can't control or something that's valuable. Learning how to catch the what ifs as if they ar arise, and you actually practice refusing to answer the question. I it's it's kind of like during a Zoom session when there's an incoming phone call, and um, and uh, and and you just decline to answer the question. And if you keep declining to answer the question, eventually the person stops calling and the mind tends to work that way. And then what do we do when we refuse to answer the question? Like in that exercise, we return our attention back to the present moment, to the task at hand. Two of my favorite quotes is Dan Zedra, worry is the misuse of the imagination. And Eckhart Tolle, worry pretends to be necessary. 